This silent giant is the K26S, a rugged, full-size, full-suspension, electric, fat-tire mountain bike. It's got a lot of good things going for it, but it's not perfect. We're going to talk about our first impressions in today's video. The K26S is a large bike and it's well suited for both tall and heavy riders. This bike is definitely at home in harsh riding conditions, be it rough roads, back roads, light trail use. This bike seems to flow through gravel roads, which is where it appears to want to be. But regardless, I've been testing it in a variety of different riding conditions so I can tell you what I think. And here's what we got. I'm going to start with my cons, the negative aspects of the bikes. There's not a lot of them, and I don't see any deal breakers, but some of these might be important to you guys, so let's just get them out of the way. No integrated tail light. They do supply you with an attachable button cell light, which is not rechargeable. It works okay, it's plenty bright, but the bike's not designed to be a commuter, so I can't really knock them too much for this. The fenders on the bike are definitely an afterthought, just designed to get the bulk of the mud that kicks up onto the frame and not really designed to keep you spotless. But again, this isn't a commuter, so I'm not really complaining about that. Our next two cons were out-of-the-box issues, which were easy to fix, but I decided to leave them in just in case you run into a similar situation on this or any other bike. First, the front tire appeared to have a high spot, and you can see and hear it in this clip. Thank you. 
this isn't isolated to any one fat tire bike as I've had it happen before on the Magicycle Cruiser Pro. I think it had the same juggernaut tires. It did the same thing. To fix it, I simply deflated and reseated the tire and it went away uh, for the most part. Still there just a tiny bit, but I decided to leave the footage in the video just so you know what to expect and how to deal with it. The rear suspension was a little bit noisy. Had some creaking anytime you get on the bike or ride over rough terrain. Another easy fix, which might be intimidating to some new riders, but I just removed all four of the bolts from the rear suspension system and added a bit of graphite to the bushings and the bolts. That did the trick. Only took about 10 minutes. Now the rear suspension is super smooth and quiet. Oh, I would like to add, I added thread locker to the bolts when reassembling the rear suspension, just in case you have to go through it as well. My last negative is something that the company has acknowledged and they're working on fixing, but it's definitely the elephant in the room. The company name and model number of the bike are borderline controversial. Personally, I could care less, and I haven't run into a single situation while riding the bike where somebody had questions about the name, but it's the internet, and well, you know how that goes. KK Bikes K26S. That's too many Ks. Too close together. Alright, so that's going to do it for the cons of the bike. Let's move on to our neutral thoughts before getting on to the positive aspects about the K26S. The tune of the bike is pretty soft, it's not very aggressive. Its acceleration is pretty mild compared to other bikes in this category. It does sport a 750 watt Bafang motor and has a top speed of 28 miles an hour with my testing. It will hold that top speed for a considerable amount of time without overheating as well. According to the heads up display, it peaks out at 1000 watts and stays there for as long as you hold full throttle. It just feels a little bit slow to react to the throttle and changes in elevation. I know these 750 watt Bafang motors are capable of more acceleration than this bike appears to have, so I assume this tune was done on purpose to help prolong the life of the battery. And because this bike will likely see a lot of use in boggy situations, the tune will be gentle on the power system and you'll be hard pressed to overstress the battery. It's all just a trade-off. Luckily you don't lose your top speed of 28 and it cruises quite nice, but a less aggressive tune simply means prolonged life of the electrical components, mainly the battery. Alright, so let's go ahead and talk about some of the pros that this bike has to offer. The K26S sports a large 17.5 amp hour battery. That's quite a bit above the 15 amp hour sweet spot for long range bikes. And it uses LG cells, so you got some good quality in there as well. Now I know I've never tested any true high end bikes, like something in the three to $5,000 downhill mountain bike range, but these are the best hydraulic brakes I've ever tested on any bike so far. They use large upgraded thick rotors and these calipers have enough stopping power to bring the bike to a halt with just one finger on each brake lever. The front hydraulic forks have really good dampening and a generous amount of preload adjustment which allows you to sweet spot this for various different weights of riders. No adjustments on the rear suspension and I don't think it's hydraulic but it is pretty stiff and does a great job of soaking up the hard impacts. I don't think they put it on there for comfort. If you want comfort a suspension seat post might soften up the blows but when you hit something hard you can feel it doing its job. But of course the 26 inch diameter 4 inch wide fat tires do a lot on their own to soak up the smaller bumps. The geometry of the bike seems to be a good compromise. You could easily cruise around on this leisurely for 2 hours, but it's really at home on the back roads. Carving through the loose gravel, this bike feels very stable. 
Quality of life features such as the heads-up display, throttle taking priority over pedal assist, and cruise control combine to make this one of the best setups I've seen so far. The bike allows you to customize your pedal assist levels, both how many you have and exactly how fast each one will go. Setup in the display is pretty intuitive as well. You may use the manual for the first time, but after that you won't have to try and memorize any settings as it's pretty obvious what you're looking at. I set mine up with 9 levels of pedal assist, the first being slow speed of about 5 miles an hour, good for when I'm walking my dog or just pedaling through boggy situations. The other 8 I matched up to the speeds on the cassette, so nothing's wasted. And to top it off, the throttle is independent of pedal assist, so if you customize your levels, you still have full power available at all times no matter what level you're in, you just hit the throttle. The cruise control is pretty well thought out. Unlike on a lot of other bikes with cruise control, it'll ignore tiny little trimmers in the throttle, meaning that you don't have to hold it perfectly steady for an extended amount of time before it'll activate. This can make cruise control on other bikes difficult to use on bumpy situations. But the cruise control on the K26S will ignore small trimmers and still activate after about 8 seconds. It'll also activate if you're holding the throttle and pedaling at the same time. And because throttle is priority over pedal assist, well, you can precisely tune exactly where the cruise control speed is to match up with your cadence. Meaning that you actually don't have to customize any of the pedal assist levels if you don't want to. But you've got the best of both worlds if you do. The heads up display is pretty easy to read in bright sunlight. Not as good as a monochrome setup, but still pretty decent for a color display. And although you get the important adjustable features, such as pedal assist levels, there's not much other customizing you can seem to do in here. Customizing the battery bar indicator level or a voltage readout would have been nice to see. However, you do get your basic features such as a speedometer, odometer, your trip meter, time, and an amp readout so you can gauge how much power you're using at any given time. You do get a USB port on the display for charging accessories, but one of those accessories you won't need to charge is a headlight because this has the second best headlight I've tested on an electric bike so far. The champion is still the Fido T1, but this is a close second. Combining the relatively large battery with a 3 amp charger means it keeps the charge times down to about 5 hours, which is pretty good considering the size of this battery. I personally prefer bikes that utilize a key as a kill switch for an extra layer of security. Not many I've tested use them, but this one does integrate a kill switch on the other hand, which is good because when you turn this off it feeds absolutely no power to the electrical systems, meaning that if you store this for a long period of time it won't slowly drain the battery. Some additional quality of life features is the 8 speed push pull trigger shifter, as you know you don't have to adjust your grip when changing speeds, and a nice set of lock on grips which are easy to adjust but will not rotate while you're riding. These grips are a bit thinner than you get on most electric bikes, this is to give you a better grip and feel of control, however the trade off is under long riding conditions they don't have much cushion. Trading better grip and control over comfort is just one of the compromises which makes sense on this style of bike. Another nice feature for this style of bike is the sleeved or shielded throttle. This allows you to roll your thumb down the body of the throttle, which is great for riding over bumpy conditions. I don't know if they did this on purpose, it's probably just a happy accident, but I prefer these over the throttles which move the entire body and make it more difficult to hold a precise speed. With the mild tune on this bike being pretty gentle on the electrical systems, even after full throttle pulls for miles on gravel roads, I never felt the motor get hot. It would be warm, but never hot to touch. Still, I appreciate that they used a beefed up connector for the speed controller to the motor. Over time, as these heat up and cool down, they can be difficult to disconnect. So if you ever need to service your motor off the bike or just want to make it easier to change the rear tire, this is going to make it a bit easier to disconnect. As during my testing at least, I never even felt this warm up. This is also only the second bike I've tested so far with a practical walk mode at 2.5 miles an hour. It's not trying to pull away from you, so if you find yourself in a situation where you need to get up a steep hill that you can't ride the bike on, this is going to help you out. This bike also comes with a really nice toolkit for assembly and adjustment. You get full size wrenches, which is almost unheard of when it comes to assembly tools. And of course you gotta love to see the ball end allen wrenches. There's a few important things to keep in mind when looking at bikes like this. Now this comes in at $1700 at the time of recording. A few hundred dollars more than other bikes in this category, but with full suspension. And a lot of new riders might see, oh, full suspension, fat tire mountain bike, I'll take it on a downhill and a bunch of dirt jumps. That's not what this bike is designed to handle, and if you do that, you'll probably destroy it. Don't get me wrong, there are no cheap quality components on this bike that I can find, but it's not using high-end components either. 
this bike is good for somebody with really crap road conditions who needs something that's not going to fall apart on the first couple potholes. Back roads, light trail use, things like that. And besides that, the weight of these large fat tire bikes with all the electrical components is not exactly something that's easy to whip around trails. And with that being said, if you had similar riding ideas as to what you see in the video, then it's pretty much perfect, as this bike seems to be well suited for my riding style. None of the fat tire electric bikes that I've tested so far are very fun to pedal without power. This is no exception. But the larger than average battery, generous seat adjustment, and geometry of the frame makes it quite easy to apply pedal assistance and help the bike along. In my testing, I've had no issues sipping power from the battery at 16 miles an hour while applying moderate pedal assist for about 15 miles, then riding 6 to 7 more miles on a trail full throttle and having plenty of battery to get back home. As with all my electric bikes, we will have a range test in the future. It'll be a few months after we've had some cycles on the battery. These are just my first impressions about what stands out on the bike. Coming in at a few hundred dollars more than other hardtail fat bikes, I think this sweet spots quite nicely. Other than coming up with a better name for the bike, something a bit more creative, I really don't have any recommendations for upgrades on this bike in this price category. I think they've done a pretty good job. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe.